I would like to introduce our first speaker for today, Provost Kai Lee. On behalf of Bridget Collier and Equal Opportunity Program's Office for Military Affiliated Communities, I wanna thank Provost Lee for her forward thinking leadership during the current pandemic and her steadfast support for the military affiliated community. Kai Lee serves as the 14th Provost of the University of Chicago, joining the university in 1998 as an assistant professor in the Department of Chemistry. Provost Lee was appointed full professor in 2008. She has served as a director of the Materials Research Science and Engineering Center, as associate director of the James Frank Institute, and has been vice provost for research since 2018. As vice provost, Kai has worked with deans, faculty, and researchers across the university to increase access to research funding, among other responsibilities. In addition, Kai is the chair of the Faculty Advisory Board for the Hong Kong Jockey Club University of Chicago Academic Complex, Francis and Rose UN campus in Hong Kong. She has played a lead role in the university's activities and partnerships there over there the past five years, including op the opening of the new facility. Please join me in, in welcoming our provost, Provost Kai Lee. Good afternoon and welcome and thank you, Terrell. Thank you all of you for joining us for this event to recognize the veterans in our University of Chicago community. As you know, November 11th is the day that the country celebrates Veterans Day to honor all those who have served in the armed services. On behalf of the university, I thank you for your sacrifice and commitment to keep our nation safe and to uphold the values that we hold dear. At the university, the Office for Military Affiliated Communities, OMAC in short, leads our work with veterans and those currently serving. I would like to thank Bridget Collier, Associate Provost of Equal Opportunity Programs, and her team members, Terrell Oldham, Scott Velasquez, and Mitchell Kithaus for organizing this week's events and their ongoing work to support military affiliated students, faculty and staff. Service members are an important part of our academic community. The university recognizes that service members bring leadership and other skills, as well as a unique perspective that adds to the diversity of our campus community. We are committed to building a community for veterans, active duty service members, ROTC cadets, and their families, while continuing to expand recruitment efforts. In the last year, the university's military affiliated student population has grown significantly. This academic year, the college welcomed 20 new first year student veterans. You may have seen the recent news story about the university surprising Army Specialist Netnail Getan Hoon stationed in Kuwait with a Zoom call to welcome him as one of the first members of the class of 2025. OMEC leads an array of initiatives, including a family readiness program to provide support networks promoting the well being of veterans who study or work at the university as well as their families. OMAC also collaborates with foundations, peer institutions, and the military community to further the efforts to support student veterans in higher education. Just this fall, thanks to a grant from the Robert R. McCormick Foundation, OMAC brought experts together for a symposium to discuss best practices for removing barriers to access and to build an effective model for transitioning student veterans into, through, and out of higher education. In addition, the University of Chicago is a new partner to the Peer Advisors for Veteran Education Program, a national student-led organization that provides resources, support, and outreach to military-affiliated students. OMAC is also strengthening the university's tie across the city. Terrell Odom, the Associate Director of OMAC, has been appointed to serve as the Advisory Council Member for Veteran Affairs 
to the university as uh, to the city of Chicago. We have a full week of programming planned. I encourage you to attend the additional events, in particular, a discussion on Friday with Senator Tammy Duckworth about the deportation of US veterans. Turning to today's program, we would hear from Brigadier General William Dyer in conversation with Stephen Foster, president of the University of Chicago Law School Veterans. They will be introduced by one of our undergraduate students, Forrest Hayden. Forrest is a fourth year in the college studying economics, a peer advisor to the Peer Advisor for Veteran Education, a PAVE program, and liaison for children of US veterans in the college. His father, Major Joseph Jolly Hayden, died in service to our country. And Forrest has partnered with OMAC to create a support network for the children of US veterans at UChicago. Please join me in welcoming Forrest Hayden. Thank you, Provost Lee, for the introduction and to the University of Chicago for providing such a welcoming environment for the children of US veterans to thrive, share ideas, and integrate our experiences into the campus community. Like many other children of US veterans, I did not believe that Veterans Day or services for veterans were part of my identity. Hesitant to respond to any of the emails coming out of the OMAC office, I was happy Terrell took a proactive approach in reaching us. He sent messages about programming for children of US veterans to our parents, my mother. During my first Zoom session with OMAC, student veterans and service organizations, I quickly learned that I am part of this community. OMAC helped me understand that as a service member or veterans move duty stations, get injured or transition out of the military service, their family meets those milestones along with them. Changing schools, states, or even countries can be extremely hard on military families. I myself have lived in seven different states or countries during my father's service. Coming into college, my first year was definitely a big transition as it is for many students. In addition, having to work through different military benefits was, con was confusing and very time consuming. And I wasn't sure who to turn to for advice. That's why I'm very excited to help stand up the Children of US Veterans with OMAC and the University of Chicago's Veterans and Family Readiness Program. This program allows for students who share the identity as children of US veterans to come together, learn from each other and support each other. Before introducing the moderator for today's program, I would like to introduce one of our active duty students to recognize the selfless sacrifice of our nation's heroes. Lieutenant Commander Ryan Hall is an active duty sailor and first year student at the University of Chicago's Booth School of Business, pursuing a second master's degree. Commissioned as an officer in 2007, Lieutenant Commander Hall graduated SEALs training from California in 2009. He has served in SEAL teams three and one in multiple roles, and he serves as the former executive officer for Special Reconnaissance Team 1. Lieutenant Commander Hall's personal decorations include a Bronze Star, Meredith Service Medal, Combat Action Ribbon, and various other ribbons and awards. He and his wife, Christina, have two children, Bobby and Charlotte. Please join me in welcoming Lieutenant Commander Hall, U.S. Navy SEALs. Thank you, Forrest, for the introduction and for standing up the group to support children of veterans. Family readiness is absolutely critical to mission success, and its importance simply cannot be overstated. I was once told in a brief by the SEAL Team 6 commander that he believed the only thing that could keep his unit from accomplishing the mission was a family that wasn't supported while that teammate was away, either training or deploying. Families make the transition with service members and veterans, and family is the most important part for us. My family, like hundreds of thousands of other military families, has sacrificed during multiple relocations, most recently for me to Chicago, so that I can pursue my graduate degree. My wife, now also a first year at Booth, is the reason that I'm able to serve. 
So I'd like to take some time just to recognize all of the veterans and service members in the virtual audience. If able, please stand and just feel recognized just for the moment for your service and your sacrifice to the nation. Okay, now any family members of a veteran or a service member, please just for a moment be recognized and know you're appreciated. And now finally, anyone who has ever supported a veteran or a military family, that support is critical. So take a moment, know, you know, take a moment for recognition and know how much it's appreciated. I now want to bring your attention to the small table set for one, which is designated to honor the service members who are missing in action or prisoners of war. Inside every dining facility in the United States military, you'll find this solemn tribute. Today, nearly 82,000 Americans remain missing in action from World War II, the Korean War, the Vietnam War, and other conflicts from around the globe. And while our hearts are heavy for our countrymen whose final resting places are known only to God, we honor and preserve their sacrifice with a sacred promise. It's emblazoned on the insignia for their cause. You are not forgotten. The tablecloth is white, symbolizing the purity of their intention to respond to their country's call to arms. The single rose is displayed in a vase and reminds us of the families and the loved ones of our comrade in arms who keep the faith awaiting their return. The yellow ribbon tied on the vase is reminiscent of the yellow ribbon worn upon the lapel of those who bear witness to their unyielding determination and demand a proper accounting of our missing. The candle is lit, symbolizing the upward reach of their unconquerable spirit. The slice of lemon is on the bread plate to remind us of their bitter fate. And there is salt on the bread plate, symbolic of the family's tears as they wait. The glass is inverted. They cannot toast with us this day. The chair is empty. They are not here. All of you who served with them and called them comrades, who depended upon their might and aid and relied upon them, for surely they have not forsaken you. Let us pause in remembrance. Until the day they come home, remember. Now, I'd like to introduce to you our our moderator for today's discussion. Stephen Foster, commissioned from the Virginia Military Institute in 2018, and is currently a third year law student at the University of Chicago, where he serves as the president of the Law School Veterans Society. He's a first lieutenant in the Army's Education Delay Program, through which he is expected to join the Army Judge Advocate General's Corps after graduating from law school. Before commencing his military service, Stephen will be clerking for the Chief District Judge of the District of New Mexico. Stephen. Thank you for that introduction, Ryan. Good afternoon, everyone, and thank you for joining us today. Brigadier General Bill Dyer is a 35-year veteran of military service and simultaneously a 35-year veteran of the civil, civilian engineering and legal professions. His path exemplifies the concept of the citizen soldier, a highly productive and successful civilian who has, a rem, who has a member of the Army Reserve is prepared to take up arms in the defense of, the, of his nation and her interests when called to do so. In fact, he's been called to serve our nation during two combat deployments. His uncommon path affords him a unique perspective on the challenges and benefits of being a citizen soldier. And more importantly, his experience demonstrates the critical role this special category of veterans plays in our society. 
Ladies and gentlemen, Brigadier General Bill Dyer. Good afternoon, University of Chicago and University of Chicago Law. Uh, thank you, Provost Lee. Thank you, Stephen, for that thankfully brief introduction. And by the way, Stephen had a, uh, a much longer and, and beautiful introduction plan, but I uh, pulled rank on him and cut it short. Nobody likes long introductions and uh, didn't think you guys needed to be subjected to that today. Uh, thanks also, Terrell uh, Odom, for your great work in Chicago's Office of Military Affiliated Communities and all the amazing things that you and your entire community are doing on behalf of, of veterans up there. Um, and of course, I appreciate all the work you guys have done being the catalyst for our discussion uh, this afternoon. Now, I'm, I'm imagining that because you were inclined to log on today uh, and hear what I have to say, this is probably not the first time you've heard a Veterans Day presentation. Uh, typically, uh, these presentations do exactly what you'd expect. They uh, honor the service of our veterans. Um, perhaps they point out acts of courage or bravery. Sometimes they focus on historical events uh, or maybe the impact of veterans on our communities and, and our country. And all these themes are valid. They're all worthwhile. They're, they're all inspiring. Uh, but uh, as Stephen foreshadowed, what you'll hear from me today is going to be entirely different. In the, the time that we have together today, I hope to give you a better, uh, maybe a deeper understanding of one particular type of veteran, veterans of uh, the reserve component of our armed forces. Uh, that is those who serve in our military part time. Uh, I intend to share with you what I believe is the compelling rationale for why we even have a reserve component of our military. Uh, I will share with you what service in the reserve component uh, feels like, what it looks like, both from the perspective of one who serves, and importantly, the perspective of those who are impacted by my service and by our service. Uh, and finally, I'm going to make the case why the, the few of you who are watching this who may feel a stirring inside uh, may feel a calling to do something in your life that adds a unique, challenging, and, and fulfilling dimension should perhaps act on that stirring. I hope uh, above all, though, to demonstrate to all of you that it's entirely possible to live a full and satisfying life as a civilian in any walk of life while serving in America's military. Now, uh, as you can probably imagine, uh, and would probably feel yourselves, uh, I am not ordinarily a fan of talking about myself. It's one of my least favorite topics. Uh, however, among all the men and women I know who have served in the reserve component of our armed forces, the one example I'm most familiar with is my own. So if you'll indulge me, I will share with you my experience and my personal observations uh, keeping in mind, and, and hopefully you'll keep in mind too, that my experience is a representative of, uh, of so many who have served and, are, and continue to serve. So a little bit of background first. Um, I grew up in Virginia. I attended and graduated with an electrical engineering degree from the Virginia Military Institute. Uh, upon graduation, I uh, was commissioned an officer in the United States Air Force as an engineer. Uh, I served, I completed my military commitment, and then thinking I was done with the military, I began a career in the, uh, in the civilian engineering field. I worked for a big defense contractor, worked on technology that at the time was ultra super top secret. Uh, it was known as and is known as GPS. So uh, yeah, back in the day, I'm dating myself a little bit, but back in the day we were developing GPS antennas and, and GPS technology. Uh, under the cloak of top secrecy. Uh, I decided that I would, I would leave engineering and pursue my lifelong dream of becoming a lawyer. So I, I entered law school and had no military obligation when I entered law school. I was, I was done with it. But during law school, the job market was kind of soft. Uh, I had a friend who'd been in the Marine Corps and we were talking one day and he said, hey, you ought to think about the JAG Corps. And I, I'm sure I had a quizzical look on my face I remember responding to him, the JAG Corps, that's the military. I've already done that. I've got the t-shirt. And, uh, but he persisted and it, it, I, I began to research it. It seemed like a great way to get some initial experience, especially when job offers weren't falling out of the, out of the sky. So I applied, accepted, and spent four years on active duty uh, in the United States Army. 
Uh, active duty, for those of you who aren't familiar, is full-time service. Um, while on active duty, uh, I participated in a number of the Army's military uh, occupational, or not military occupational specialties, but military's core competencies, uh, primarily criminal law. I did some administrative law and some soldier and family legal services work as well. But it was a very uh, well-rounded and full, uh, full four years of, of duty. Uh, my wife and I decided that I would eventually leave active duty and enter private practice. We, we uh, you know, you've heard the stories of some of those who spoke before me about the frequent moves that they had. That, that works for some families. It doesn't work for others. We decided that we wanted to plant somewhere and, and kind of stay there. So I got out of the Army uh, and intended to enter private practice, and in fact, did enter private practice. Uh, but on my way out of the Army active duty, I had to stop by the Army Reserve recruiter as one of the boxes I had to check on my way out. And he said, how about the Army Reserve? Have you thought about that? And I had no idea what the Army Reserve was at the time. And he explained uh, in uh, greatly simplistic terms, one weekend a month, a couple weeks during the summer, you know, no big deal. You make a couple hundred extra bucks. I had one, one daughter and another on the way and, and a couple hundred extra bucks for hanging out with my Army buddies one weekend a month. It seemed like a pretty good deal. So I, I signed up and, and began doing it. But that's the point in my life when my private practice began to take off. I initially joined a small intellectual property boutique. Uh, if you're not familiar with the terminology, that's a, a law firm that does only one specialty. And my, my specialty was patent law, and my first firm did only patent law. Uh, I left that firm after a few years, went to a large general practice firm, and for the law students in the audience, if you're familiar with the, the names of the biggest firms in the country, uh, the name of that firm would, would be familiar to you. Uh, I was humming along there, having a great old time uh, when I got a call one day from a headhunter who told me about the, the opportunity to go work at the largest corporation in the world and the best legal in-house legal department in the world, General Electric. Uh, I jumped on it, went there, uh, enjoyed that job somewhat, but learned about myself that I preferred practicing law uh, over managing others who were practicing law. So I I left that, joined a firm, the, the largest intellectual property firm in the, in the world, uh, spent 15 years, the bulk of my professional career there. And it's what's known as an AMLAW 100 firm. So one of the 100 largest firms in the country. I uh, started as an associate, progressed to of counsel, progressed to non-equity partner, and then eventually rose to the highest level of, of the partnership, uh, what's known as equity partner. Did a bunch of additional things while I was there, including being hiring partner uh, for seven years, uh, successfully build tons of hours, developed a bunch of business, and really uh, developed completely as an intellectual property litigator. Worked with some of the best in the country, uh, opposed some of the best in the country, and, and uh, you know, as, uh, as iron sharpens iron, uh, I got better. I was fortunate to have a, a number of national recognitions during that time, and and did uh, a good bit of special master work. Um, as I sit here today and I look back at it, uh, I've, I've had a what I consider to be a pretty successful career in intellectual property law. Uh, I can promise you though, that I far exceeded the meager expectations that I had for myself coming out of law school. I, I could not have projected that my career as a, as a patent attorney, as an IP lawyer, uh, would have worked out the way it did. But there are a lot of successful lawyers out there, and the fact that I've had a pretty good run in my civilian profession isn't why I'm here today, and that's really not what you came to hear. Uh, I'm here today because, as Stephen said, at the same time I was climbing the ladder in my civilian employment, I had this whole other second life. Uh, I was an officer in the Army Reserve. Now, I mentioned that before I entered the Army Reserve, I was on active duty. Uh, and I, I talked a little bit about a few of the, the areas of law I dealt with uh, there. My reserve duty mirrored that, uh, although just on a part-time basis. I entered the Army Reserve as a captain, did a variety of different types of legal jobs, uh, operational law, national security law, uh, other military legal specialties, and different types of Army units for several years. Uh, typically, it was one weekend a month, Occasionally, uh, I would spend a week in the legal office of an active Army installation, Fort Benning, Fort Bragg, Fort Stewart, 
uh, principally places in the Southeast US. Uh, and occasionally I went places like Germany and worked, uh, you know, did army legal work in places like that for a week or so. I was eventually promoted to major. Uh, when I was promoted to major with that increased rank came increased responsibility, became the senior legal advisor for an army engineer unit. And it was uh, while I was with that engineer unit that I was deployed to Iraq for a year. I returned, uh, reintegrated into my civilian firm, uh, eventually was promoted to Lieutenant Colonel where, uh, where the job started getting really exciting. I, I became a senior legal advisor for two different, very large army units. One was a medical command of about 4,000 soldiers, uh, principally doctors, nurses, paramedics, uh, and all the support personnel that they needed. Uh, that unit's mission was to provide medical care to our troops who were engaged in combat in Southwest Asia. Uh, my other job as Lieutenant Colonel was a senior legal advisor for what the Army calls a signal command. Really, it's a communications command. And they provided all the network uh, communications capability also in Southwest Asia. So two very dynamic units, uh, both in the four to 5,000 soldier range, I was a senior legal advisor. Um, and it was, it was during these two jobs that I actually began managing other lawyers, other Army lawyers in all of the Army's legal specialties. Uh, so it was a it was a little bit of a stretch for me, uh, but uh, but one that comes with that rank and, and that position. Um, I didn't do too bad a job at those jobs and, and was promoted to colonel. Uh, when I became a colonel, my first job was to ensure the military training and the military legal training for 1,800 lawyers and paralegals who were in the United States Army Reserve Legal Command. So 1,800 lawyers and paralegals spread across the United States, and my responsibility was to make sure that they were militarily proficient and proficient in military legal specialties. Uh, I then took command of an Army unit of lawyers in Philadelphia. Uh, our principal mission there was, uh, was to provide legal support to our forces in Germany and uh, operations in Africa. I was then promoted to Brigadier General um, about three years ago. So as Brigadier General, my work has been at the Pentagon. I'm the Assistant Judge Advocate General for Military Law and Military Operations. Uh, and I've held that job, as I said, for three years with the exception of nine months where I was deployed to Afghanistan. And, and while in Afghanistan, I uh, was the director for rule of law. My primary job was to work with uh, our NATO partners and our 41 coalition partners in establishing the rule of law in a country that has struggled to have the rule of law established for a couple thousand years, I think. Uh, challenging job, nine months, uh, came back in early 2019 and, and resumed my duties at the Pentagon. So I think, I, you know, certainly by my, by my estimation, and I think by any, I've, I've had a very fulfilling military career. So what you see here is two completely separate lives in parallel. And the reason today is so much fun for me is because it's one of the very few opportunities I have ever had to reflect on both simultaneously, uh, to have a chance to kind of tease out some of the interconnections between the civilian career and my military career. I speak frequently on both, but never together. And this is the first time that I can remember that I've really had an opportunity to, to, uh, to kind of um, dig into some of those interconnections. Um, before I do that, I want to take a quick step back and, and discuss with you uh, something you may or may not be aware of, and that is why do we even have an Army Reserve? So the need for the Army Reserve, and, and when I say Army Reserve, I understand that I'm referring you know, to the Air Force Reserve, the Navy Reserve, the Marine Corps Reserve as well. Uh, but, but because I'm, I'm uh, brainwashed by the Army, I'm going to talk Army Reserve today. Uh, the reason we have an Army Reserve really is rooted or finds its root in two separate documents, uh, our National Security Strategy and our National Defense Strategy. Now, these, these documents aren't somewhere in the National Archives only to be seen you know, under glass. These are documents that you can jump online, read, take a look at. They're very interesting. They're not particularly long. Uh, they're publicly available. 
you, you, if you choose to read these two documents, National Security Strategy and National Defense Strategy, you will have a very good idea what we intend to do as a nation strategically for our security and our defense. You can read them. Putin can read them. Uh, anybody can, anybody who, who is interested in reading these documents can. Interestingly, and, and particularly in, in the environment we're in right now, I, I'd, I'd simply point out to you that those documents are not inherently political documents. Uh, in fact, they're updated periodically, but not, you know, the updates don't coincide with uh, changes in political leadership. You can go back and look over those documents for the, the last 10, 15 years, and you'll see some subtle shifts in them. But those subtle shifts have a lot less to do with who's in the White House or who controls Congress than they do with what's going on in the world. Most of the ch changes in those documents and most of the updates relate to what, what is actually changing uh, out in the world. Um, so if you look at those documents over the, you know, over the past certainly 10, maybe 15 years, you'll see that, that we have four what we call near peer competitors, Russia, China, North Korea, and Iran. And then there are, uh, of course, other significant threats. We have ISIS, Al Qaeda, we have others, uh, and that cast of characters is changing uh, pretty frequently. So in our national strategy, we have to calculate what we need to do to remain safe. And the decision that has been made by the civilian leadership of our country is that we need to be able to simultaneously fight and win against two of those near peer competitors. And oh, at the same time, we have to maintain enough capability, enough, enough excess capability to deter the others from taking advantage of us when, because we might be over leveraged. Well, as far as the Army goes, to accomplish this is no small task. And, and our national leadership believes that we need about 1 million soldiers to be able to simultaneously fight and win decisive victories against two of those competitors and hold everybody else at bay. At one million soldiers is the army's piece of that. The problem is we can't afford one million full-time soldiers. That's extremely expensive. So uh, we have hedged our bets. We have an active army of about 500,000 full-time soldiers. The other 500,000, guess where they come from? The Army Reserve and the National Guard. Uh, so we get by accomplishing this need for 1 million soldiers by paying somewhat more than half of what we would have to pay if we had a full standing army of 1 million. Uh, it's a great system. It's a system that works economically for our country, but it only works for our country in terms of strategy if the Army Reserve is fully capable, fully ready when needed to stand alongside and perform the same mission with the exact same skill as our active army counterparts. Now, we've had an army reserve for a long, long time. Army reserve has been active in every major conflict this nation has been in. Uh, and even if you're not tracking the participation of the army reserve back in World War II and before, certainly over the past 20 years in Iraq and Afghanistan, uh, you're probably aware that your army reserve has demonstrated conclusively that it is up to that task. I think it's also uh, important, and I can't pass up an opportunity to remind myself and remind all of us that, that it's this capability, in addition to being lethal, is also a powerful deterrent. You know, being able to field the, the best trained, best equipped, and most lethal fighting force the world has ever known isn't just wonderful because it allows us to win battles and win wars. Uh, I would submit to you that its greatest benefit is that it's the greatest force for peace the world has ever known. Having this force that's so capable, so potentially lethal, allows our civilian diplomats around the world to negotiate with, from a position of strength and not a position of weakness. The bottom line, uh, ladies and gentlemen, is we need 500,000 Americans who are willing to live the kind of dual life that I've been living for the last you know, few decades. We also need more. We need thousands of employers. We need thousands of coworkers who are willing to pick up the slack when, when duty calls one of us in uniform away. Might be for a week or for a year. We need communities. We need families who are, uh, who are grateful for the abundance and the freedoms that we enjoy in this great nation. And while they themselves might not choose to serve or might not be able to serve, 
Uh, we need communities and families who are willing to support the selfless nature and the service of those who can uh, serve and do choose to serve. Only uh, you know, an interesting statistic, only 1% of, Ameri of Americans have served in the military, 1%. Uh, that's not a big number. Yet the security of our nation and really the, the stability of the entire free world rests on the shoulders of a very few. And that is why we need to have, and that's why we need to support an Army Reserve. So uh, let's shift gears and, and get kind of to the, to the nut of what I wanted to discuss with you guys today. Um, I am occasionally asked, and I frequently ponder the question, has serving in the Army Reserve hurt my civilian job? I mean, for sure, I have billed fewer hours. Um, I brought in fewer clients. Uh, on a couple occasions, I've missed a year and close to a year. Uh, I also sometimes, in a different context, am asked whether only focusing on mili military service part-time uh, has somehow kept me from being all I can be in the military. Uh, good questions both and I'll address them both. Being perfectly honest, in the early years of my professional life, I felt that the answer to both questions was yes. I just had this gripping feeling that dividing my attention between two completely different lives uh, was to the detriment of both. I thought about quitting the army, I thought about focusing on billing hours, making money for the firm and for myself on, you know, becoming a partner faster, faster, faster. Uh, I didn't obviously, and I'm glad because what I know now with certainty is exactly the opposite. Without both of those careers simultaneously, I would not have been as good or as successful in either. And I'll, I'll tease that out a little bit for you. Let's, let's start with the less intuitive angle. So the question is, how has my civilian career enhanced my Army career? And I like to start this analysis with the unassailable, absolutely indisputable truth that success in any endeavor is predicated on good communication, the ability to convey thoughts, the ability to listen, to understand, uh, to read between the lines, to modulate and moderate responses so they're appropriate for uh, or they connect with different types of listeners. Now, in the military, you do a lot of communicating, but the vast majority of it's with other soldiers. Now, some are senior in rank, some are your peers, some are junior to you. Uh, and it's true that soldiers do come from all corners of the country. They come from all levels of our socioeconomic structure. Uh, the military is a brilliant melting pot of races, preferences, genders, backgrounds, commu communication styles, you name it. But there's also tremendous commonality. So all who serve in the military have given themselves to serving a cause greater than themselves. That's the starting point. Uh, they've all willingly placed themselves in a structured environment with very clear rules and customs. Uh, we all share a common vocabulary even amongst the services. So what I find is that as diverse as the communication challenges are in the military, they're diverse within a relatively narrow range. So think about inserting into the military environment a soldier who, as a civilian, has had to learn to communicate with a much broader and diverse audience than you even have in the military. I mean, you consider a lawyer, for example, who has to communicate in a way that inspires confidence in my clients so that I continue getting work from them. Clients in the United States, clients overseas, uh, clients who are not principally given to a greater cause, but are principally given to legal victories. Uh, you know, consider a bulldozer salesman or a, a pharmaceutical rep uh, who has to differentiate and sell highly complex products in a highly competitive commercial environment. Consider a high school teacher who has somehow developed the skills to instill in her teenage students a thirst for knowledge and, and, and can somehow persuade them to follow her lead in learning. 
I mean, do you think that learning to communicate in a far broader civilian context sharpens your ability to communicate in that narrower military context? You think that broader range of experiences outside the military come into play when you're providing advice to your superiors or when you're selling an operational plan to your peers or when you're leading young troops? You better believe it does. I've seen it over and over again. Beyond that, beyond the communication skills, there are actual physical skills that you pick up as a civilian that the military simply doesn't have. You know, I mentioned that I was deployed uh, to Iraq with a unit of engineers. Well, the, the military and the army in particular has engineers, but they tend to be involved in, in battlefield engineering operations, you know, building temporary bridges, blowing stuff up, you know, uh, setting and removing mines, that, that type of stuff. There really are no engineers in the military who do what my engineering unit needed to do in Iraq, which was get into Iraq identify the shortcomings in the power plant, the, the power grid in Iraq, and rebuild or fix uh, power generation stations. But in my Army Reserve unit, we had a number of engineers who had significant experience with the, those high-powered gas turbines that are used to operate those, uh, those power plants. We brought to the Army skills that simply don't exist in the Army. We also have uh, in the Army Reserve civil affairs Unit. Civil affairs folks uh, are school administrators, they're mayors, they're city council people. And when, when as we have significant, in significant measure over the past 20 years in Iraq and Afghanistan, going into places where we're trying to help communities stand up, those are the specialties we need. But they don't exist in the active army. So those are just two quick examples of ways that actual physical skills that reservists have uh, can be brought to the battle and, and help us accomplish our military ends. So there's really no question that skills you obtain in the civilian world, whether it's communications, engineering, civil affairs, or something else, benefit you in the military, bet you, benefit you in military service. Um, so let's take a look at, the, at it from the other angle. Let's take a look at the benefit of military service in a civilian walk of life. So I, I mentioned earlier, and it's really no surprise that uh, when, you <laughs> when you spend time in uniform, in military services, reservists, you're going to build a few hours, you're going to sell fewer bulldozers, you're going to teach fewer kids. Uh, but there are, are uh, notable and I think well-recognized benefits. First and foremost, uh, United States military training is the best leadership training in the world, period, full stop. There is no organization that has so rigorously researched uh, leadership training models around the world, really, not just in the United States, not my alma mater GE, not IBM, not Pfizer, and certainly not some law firm. Uh, no disparagement meant to law firms. No organization has so methodically implemented leadership training into its core curriculum at every level. I got, and Stephen, you know, as a first lieutenant, has already had some basic leadership training, actually several years of basic leadership training. When I was promoted to general, the first thing they sent me to was leadership training. I mean, you'd think at some point that class, you know, isn't available anymore. Not so, not so. We're learning at every level. And there's no organization that has so relentlessly continued to improve its leadership model uh, as we continue to get smarter as a, as a society, as a culture, and as an army. Why? I mean, what, what's with the army's or the military's fixation on leadership? And I'll tell you, it's because there is no other organization in this country or in the world that more humans, more Americans and others depend on to perform the most difficult tasks in the most austere environments with the highest stakes than our US military. And in those times when we are put to the test and when freedom hangs in the balance, there is no room for imprecise and ineffective leadership. The military invests in leadership because leadership is an investment the military has to make. So let me ask you this. You think an understanding of how to lead and how to be led is valuable to a civilian employer? 
you think having the willingness to serve ideals greater than your own is the kind of thing that is desired in a civilian organization? How about having the ability and the discipline to persevere through adversity, whether it's a, a lost legal case or a, a down quarter of sales or a problematic group of students and not lose focus on your objective is recognized? You think it's valued? There's a, a good reason why civilian employers flock to hire military veterans. And even if you only serve four years, and even if your service was entirely in the reserve component, you stand out among your peers at work, in your communities, and in your families. So that's all kind of high level stuff. Let's, let's take a minute and get practical. Now, I, I know you're all familiar with the saying, it's not what you know, it's who you know, right? And usually that phrase is, is a tacit, it's called a tacit indictment of cronyism. So it's friends helping friends, stuff like that. It's a uh, kind of a shrug your shoulders way of explaining why you didn't get an opportunity and somebody else did. Let me put a little different shine on it. Those who serve in the military meet a lot of people. And they see their fellow service members serving voluntarily. They see their fellow service members operating under pressure, stress. They see each other in unfamiliar situations and strange environments. And importantly, those soldiers they serve with see them operating in those same situations. In the military, you learn a lot about each other. So fast forward 10, 20 years beyond your early military service. For me, there are soldiers I served with in those early years that have done pretty well. A general counsel for UPS, a congressman, a lieutenant governor, U.S. attorneys, presidents and senior executives of companies, senior lawyers in, in top corporations and law firms. And when these individuals need help and when they have a need for the kind of services or effort that I can provide, are they likely to turn to me? This has very little to do with friendship. These cats, I promise you, all have a lot of friends. And a lot of their friends are closer to them than I am. But from among all those friends, the question they're going to ask themselves is this, who can I really rely on? Who can I trust? Who's never going to quit? Who's not going to be phased when the going gets tough, when the situation's ambiguous, when the issues are hot? Because of our time together and, and years ago in the challenging environment of military service, when they pick up the phone and they call me, they know what they're going to get. Now, importantly, this familiarity is broader than just personal relationships. As a, a civilian employer, I mentioned earlier that I'd been a hiring partner at a big firm for about seven years. I hired a lot of people. And I can tell you, when a resume came across my desk with military service on it, I knew a thing or two about that person well before we met. And knowing a thing or two about how a person's going to react under pressure, how they're going to fit into an organization, how they're going to handle the trust and responsibility that he or she is given is no small thing. The network of military alumni is. is it's pretty powerful interconnected fabric. Now, you might not have served in the military and you may not have those interconnections and you might not have that experience from military service, but that doesn't mean you don't benefit from them. Think about the people around you from day to day. I mean, you, you know, the law students in the audience, think for a minute about who's in your, in your law classes. Think about uh, co-workers at your last job. You know, your, who's your homeowners association, your Rotary Club, your adult league soccer team, you know, any group of people you're with regularly. And reflect on those in the organization who have military service in their backgrounds. Reflect on what they meant to your organization, your school, your company. Reflect on their, their quiet focus, their team orientation, the selfless way they went about their business, even in hard times, no matter what those hard times were. Veterans bring this to our schools. They bring it to our communities. They make our world a better place, not just because they happen to have been in the military, 
But because of the way their military service shaped them, they serve others still. They give more than they take, and they're worthy of being honored. In conclusion, I am going to end where I started. It is entirely possible to balance and to achieve uh, levels of satisfaction and success in, in dual military and civilian careers. At this very moment, today, there are 500,000 Americans doing this right now as members of the Army Reserve. Now, you may never see them in uniform. They may never talk about their side jobs. Uh, they're your friends, acquaintances. Uh, they're your neighbors, might be your classmates or coworkers. All of us in the Army Reserve serve voluntarily. Uh, and because of our service, we're going to miss some weekend parties. We're going to uh, occasionally miss a class. We might need help at work covering down on a project. Our billable hours or our sales numbers might be a little bit low if we've been off on military duty. But I think you know why. And despite whatever inconveniences or difficulties our absences in the name of military duty might cause you, I hope you have a fuller understanding of what this category of veterans means to our national security and how this category of veterans, my, my category of veterans, contributes to your school, your company, your community, and indeed our country. I am humbled to have had the opportunity to serve you and to continue serving you, my fellow Americans, for the past 35 years. I'm humbled to have had the opportunity to be with you today. Thank you, and uh, time permitting, I'm happy to take any questions you might have. Well, thank you, General Dyer, for your captivating words. I was, I mean, highly, I was on the edge of my seat the whole entire uh, time you were talking. So at this point, uh, if you'd like to, if anyone in the crowd would like to uh, ask General Dyer any questions, Questions, feel free to drop those in the Q&A box at the uh, bottom of your screen. Looks like we'll have about 20 minutes, um, about 20 minutes for, for Q&A. Um, but be before getting to some of the questions we already have piled up in there, um, I just, I wanted to ask, um, you know, I feel like most people on this call have seen uh, a few good men. You know, they, they've seen Tom Cruise in action. That, that's what they, uh, they think of when, when they hear uh, the term judge advocate. Um, so going off of that, I would just love to, to hear, hear uh, the most interesting and rewarding experience that you've had in your time in the JAG Corps. Steven, Steven, that's, you're supposed to prep me for a question like that. That's a tough one because I've had so many incredible experiences. Uh, you know, um, for me, and, and, and this is this is deeply personal, and I I'm I don't know that I've ever shared this with my family, but but I you know I've served since the Reagan administration, and, and our country, our culture, our people have changed a lot. We've evolved a lot over that time, and and uh, you may recall that uh, at the early part of my service, you know, uh, homosexuality was a was a characteristic that, that would get you booted out of the military. And then under President Clinton, we had, uh, you know, we had a change, and that that change has continued to uh, to evolve. But uh, but I recall, you know, as a youth growing up in Virginia, never having any interaction with anyone who uh, who was homosexual. And then when I was, uh, you know, in an early in my early days in in the Army, I represented uh, because I was assigned to represent a very fine soldier who was a nurse anesthetist in the army who was uh, being processed for separation because of his sexual orientation. Uh, that was an eye-opening representation for me in a lot of ways. It, it challenged, uh, it, I wouldn't say it challenged my beliefs, but it certainly uh, opened my eyes to, uh, to a different way of viewing the world and a different way of viewing military service, a different way of appreciating uh, what causes someone to be a contributor and, and you know, what disqualifies someone from being able to be a contributor. Uh, so I look back on, on that representation and with the, with the relationship I developed with that, that one of my clients uh, early on um, as, as uh, particularly significant. 
Uh, I would say also, uh, you know, really an earth shattering or a, a paradigm changing moment for me was, was when I arrived in Iraq. We were part of the very first wave of Americans into a country that had been indoctrinated by its leadership to believe that Americans were evil uh, and we were tyrannical and we were going to take money and do bad things to women and children. And I have a, I have a, a suite of experiences from that time overseas where I can't describe to you the joy and the pride that I felt in interacting with Iraqis and seeing the light bulb come on, having them realize that that America, that the United States was not the evil empire they'd been indoctrinated to believe it was, but in fact, we were, were an incredible force for good. And, and uh, you know, developing those relationships was, uh, was a remarkable experience. A little bit outside just the, the jag lane, but, uh, but those two jump out at me immediately. Well, thank you for that. Uh, so Diane Hodges, uh, she comments that I think it's quite obvious that uh, being a JAG attorney in the military will definitely sharpen your litigation skills. Uh, but do you think it, it tees you up for uh, being a JAG attorney on transactional practice? Mm -hmm. Great question. So we, the, the, the Army has, and I know the Air Force and, and Navy have rough equivalents, have a number of military legal specialties. Uh, obviously, criminal law, which is what we were what you we were referencing a minute ago. There's soldier and family legal services where you provide legal services to, to uh, fam soldiers and their family members and retirees. Uh, there is also uh, what's known as administrative law. Admin you know, the Army is governed by a massive amount of regulate rules and regulations in, in all shapes and fashions. Some of them are Department of Defense instructions. Some of them are laws, uh, you know, and, and the whole gamut in between. Uh, the Army is, is dedicated with laser-like focus on spending money, doing operations, that kind of thing, legally and ethically. And to do that, you know, uh, we have to ensure that we're complying with those regulations. A lot of those regulations relate to our interactions with outside, entities outside the Army, other entities with, within the Army. And so while the transactional practice is not exactly the same that you would see in a civilian practice, uh, you know, the process of understanding guidelines that exist through rules, regulations, and laws, the process of negotiating deals and agreements based on those, and, uh, you know, we've got the additional wrinkle of having to make sure that money that's, that's allocated for military use by Congress is used properly. It creates an interesting and complex triangulation of things that, uh, that, that in, in my estimation, certainly prepares you for the kind of rigor that you need to be able to practice if you're going to be a high-level transactional lawyer, even if the subject matter is somewhat different. So the next question we have comes from Andrew Zeller, um, and he makes a really good point. Uh, as um, so all the two L's that are currently on the call are gearing up for uh, on-campus interviews here, and I think about a month or two. Um, so he asks, uh, as a two L about to interview for summer jobs, uh, he'd like to know if you have any advice on identifying which specific firms uh, would see the value that you're uh, that you've commented on here today, uh, and be welcoming to an attorney serving in the reserves. Well, there are two approaches, Andrew. Uh, one, you could you could contact the human resources department at the firm, and guess what they're going to tell you? We love it. We love it. Uh, or you could you could look at the bios of the people who are at the firm and reach out directly to them. That's what I would do. Uh, I, there is probably someone in that firm who has served in the military or is currently serving in the military. I'd pick up the phone and call them, ask them what's it like. You know, I. Uh, you know, my, when I joined that that general practice firm, and I, I you know, my bio is not a secret. It's a great firm, and I love the firm, and I still have friends there. But when I asked them after I arrived what their military leave policy was, and they're like, "Military leave? What's that?" You know, uh, they didn't even have a vacation policy. I mean, their view was, "You got you know 365 days to build this number of hours, and what you do in your free time is is yours." 
but but uh, and, and by the way, that is generally the way I'd say you know most larger firms view things. You know, they don't. It doesn't matter to them whether you take two weeks off to climb Mount Everest or take two weeks off to to you know work at at Fort Benning or Fort Hood or or wherever. Uh, but to answer your question specifically, Andrew, I would the first step I would take is to research the firm, find out if there's anyone you can reach reach out to directly and uh, ask them that question. So the, our next question comes from Aaron McPhee. Uh, Aaron, thanks you for, for your time and candor today, as do I. Um, Aaron would like to know, uh, how do you feel about the transitions that you experienced between milita military and civilian life um, given their fluidity as distinct from those of active duty folks uh, that might undertake, uh, that they might undertake during a one-time transitional period, i.e. any distinct challenges and opportunities that they may face? Yeah, thanks, Aaron. That's a, that's a really good question and, and one that you would never get if you weren't in a forum like this. Uh, the, challenge, the, the challenges are significant. Uh, it, they're also refreshing. You know, if you think of, I mean, listen, I think patent law is fizzle, right? I mean, I've been doing it a long time. It's a lot of fun. Uh, but there have been times in my career when I, when I think, man, a break, just, just a couple of weeks, you know, a little bit of time doing something different would be a lot of fun. Uh, it, it requires you to develop a, a sense of intellectual uh, agility that you probably wouldn't have to develop otherwise. Um, you know, I, there are, you know, some downsides that I didn't get to, you know, if I'm, if I'm off doing military duty and I, I live in Atlanta, if I'm traveling to DC or I'm doing something and, and listen, when I'm gone for the weekend doing military duty, it's not sitting around eating donuts and reading the paper. I mean, it, it's busy stuff uh, and it's challenging. So I get back late Sunday night, you know, I pet the dog, hi to the family. I'm in bed, you know, Monday morning, I'm dragging a little bit. Uh, you know, everybody else is talking about the football game or the, or the whatever happened. You know, they had the barbecue, they, hang, they were hanging out, sporting their tans. Uh, you know, it, it's, it's a little bit of a challenge that way. Uh, you know, coming back from deployment, um, that, was a, that was a significant transition. And frankly, when I got back from Iraq initially, uh, my, my motivation was to, my feet hit the ground in Atlanta. I, I don't think I unpacked. Within 48 hours, I was back in the firm, you know, and I, I remember sitting there looking at, at, at a, some nasty letter that some lawyer sent me saying, who cares? I mean, I was just you know, like three days ago, I was somewhere and somebody was shooting at me and now I'm, I'm dealing with this, really? So I got smarter the second time and I took a little bit of time off and my firm's, uh, you know, I, I, I tell you, I've had nothing but amazing support from my civilian employers. When I came back this last time, you know, they didn't even ask me when I was coming back. They said, you tell us when you're really ready and being a little smarter this time. And I think we're all a little smarter now about the effect of being away from family, being in an austere environment for a while, you know, what that, what that uh, does to you, how it affects your thinking and the fact that it takes you a little time to get back in the game. But, uh, but Aaron, that's a, that's a great, a great question. I hope I've answered it. So I really like this next question that we have on deck from <laughs> an anonymous attendee. Um, the anonymous attendee asks, uh, or starts by saying, uh, what strikes me about your service is the incredible amounts of discipline it requires to achieve such amazing milestones. I think that's definitely true. Uh, for those civilians in the crowd, what training have you received or what personal rules do you follow in both your practice and your service uh, that you think have contributed to most of your success? Um, boy, such a good, that's a really a good question. I would, uh, you know, I, I've been surrounded by, by great teammates. I mean, peers, subordinates, leaders, uh, you know, I, it, it has, so it's been very easy for me to shine the light on them. Uh, you know, I've, I've always been more focused on those around me succeeding than in, you know, in any success I, uh, I felt 
had you know any success that I might have been been seeking, and that is a as kind of a general underlying principle has has helped me. Uh, you know, it, it law can be a, a competitive environment. You know, the military in its own way is a competitive environment. Uh, but what we learn in the military very quickly, and and one of the things that that certainly trickled over into my civilian life was, you know, you're, you're only as good as the weakest link and you prop up the people around you, you give them opportunities, uh, you, you coach them, you mentor them, you train them. And over time, uh, they are going to lift you up. So I think that is, as a, as a basic principle, uh, you know, has, has kind of been one of my guiding lights. Uh, the other is the balance. And, and I didn't, you know, in the short amount of time we have today, I didn't get a great chance to talk about balance. Uh, but I've been blessed with, you know, an incomparable family who's been supportive. Uh, you, you know, I, my, my wife was willing to, uh, to give up a very successful profession uh, in order to support me and what I was doing. And, and, you know, I've got two remarkable daughters who didn't have a father around, you know, for some important milestone uh, dates. Uh, and I think insofar as your family not just immediate family, but extended family. I think showing them appreciation uh, for what you're doing as you're going through it, making them feel to the greatest extent possible that they're part of the process uh, and part of the team uh, allows them to lift you up. So uh, that's that's such a good question and a and a uh, difficult one. But I'd I'd say those are probably two of the two of the principles that that it might be counterintuitive, but I think those are, are two principles that are most directly responsible for any success that I've had. So our next question comes from uh, our friend at Loyola, Loyola School of Law, uh, Lenny Reinhardt. Um, and this is especially interesting for me, uh, currently, in, uh, uh, currently taking modern professional responsibility. Um, have you experienced or observed any circumstances throughout your career which presented a conflict between your military duties and the professional responsibilities or obligations uh, associated with being an attorney? And how are these conflicts resolved? Great question. Uh, in simple terms, I have not. Uh, I've been honest with my clients. Uh, I've been honest with my firms. Uh, I've explained, you know, in, in times and courts as well. I mean, I, you know, I do a lot of litigation, primarily litigation. And so, uh, so I have, I have always, you know, you, you got an obligation to, you know, zealously advocate for your clients, whether you're in the military or in the civilian context. Um, there are times when an, an absence, you know, might make it difficult to do that. I mean, I, it, it, particularly for probably the last 10 or 15 years of my career, typically when a client hires my firm, they're looking, they, they're hiring me. I mean, they want me to be the one who's, who's taking the lead in court and, and, and uh, you know, advancing their interests. And I always make sure that they know uh, in advance that there are times when I may not be, be available and we'll ask the court for accommodations, opposing counsel for accommodations, that kind of thing. In terms of substantive conflicts, I've not come across any. Um, the, and, and this is a, a question that's especially interesting in the context of reserve component uh, service. Um, I, you know, I am a, as a, as a general officer, I have to comply, well, all army officers and particularly all JAGs have to comply with, uh, uh, you know, with rules of professional responsibility in their state and also military rules of professional responsibility, which largely mirror those. Uh, as a general officer, I'm held to a higher, uh, degree of scrutiny. I have to, to, uh, you know, disclose representations to the government. I have to, to disclose my financial dealings to the government. I have to, you know, and I've, I've put in place mechanisms to make sure that I'm not conducting any financial transactions on my own. I, all those are done at arm length. And if there were any situations where I was representing companies that were participating in bidding process for government contracts, and if I was in the loop of making the decision on, on who was gonna be awarded those contracts, that would be a problem that that both I and the government would want to identify early so that it could be avoided. Uh, I've, I've had to counsel uh, senior leaders who were involved in that uh, that kind of situation. 
And I'm happy to say that I've never come across a situation where one of those senior leaders didn't back away from it immediately upon learning that there, that there was that, that either conflict, potential conflict, or, or at least an appearance of a potential conflict. That's a great question. So un undoubtedly over the course of your uh, military career, you've had a very diverse uh, set of experiences, experiences as a judge advocate. Uh, my question to you is, how has the scope of your responsibility or maybe the time required, how has everything changed since the beginning? So uh, more specifically, I guess, how, how, do, how does, uh, how have the roles uh, that you have, the, the role that you have now and the amount of time that that requires, how does that differ from, from when you started? Great question. Uh, and I'll, I'll make a long story as short as I can. So in the early years, probably from captain through major, uh, it, was, it really was one week in a month and then a week or two in the summer. I rarely thought about my reserve duty until like the Thursday night before the weekend began. That was because I needed to get a haircut on Friday so I didn't show up looking like a, like a hippie. Uh, when I became a Lieutenant Colonel, and I mentioned earlier, I, I became the senior legal advisor for a medical command and a signal command. Well, my duty ostensibly was on Saturdays and Sundays, on one Saturday and one Sunday a week. But you know, we had, we had troops in Southwest Asia and they, they work more than just one week in a month. They're, they're going all the time and legal issues came up all the time. So that's the point in my career when I began to get calls in the evening, uh, when occasionally I had to monitor email traffic during the week uh, and, and deal with issues during the week. Uh, and that's when it probably began to chew into my, my billable hours a little bit more uh, than it did. Now, you know, I'm in a much different situation. I mean, this is, uh, you know, my duties at the Pentagon, uh, the Pentagon's closed on the weekends mostly. So I'm at the Pentagon, you know, two or three times a month, two or three days at a time. Uh, I've got a fantastic staff up there. They handle a lot of the day-to-day -day stuff. I've got an active duty counterpart who's there at the Pentagon. Uh, but, but yeah, I, I spend, uh, I, as a general officer at the Pentagon, I spend a lot of time uh, during the week up there now. And I work correspondingly less at my civilian job. So it looks like we have time for one last question. Um, if this isn't too, uh, too uh, similar to the question we asked earlier, um, what is the best piece of advice you've ever received uh, that's, that's helped you uh, have such a successful career? You know, we, uh, we get hung up on, hung up. I mean, we, you know, we're, we're focused on in, in laws. And, I, and I'll, I'm, gonna, I'm gonna narrow this purposely down to the legal realm, both the military legal realm and the civilian legal realm. You know, we get hung up on laws and regulations and rules. And, you know, we parse these huge documents and we're, you know, determining the meaning of is and that. And, and you know, we can really get down in the weeds. Uh, advice I got very early on that has proven to be correct in almost every instance is when I, when I deal with a situation and I'm, I've either got to make a decision between right and wrong, or I've got to advise a commander on right or wrong, my gut is right about 99.9% .9 of the time. I mean, I, and I would, I would suggest to all of you listening that while going on your gut is not an appropriate substitute for legal research, for following precedent, for consulting with mentors, peers, superiors, and subordinates. There's something in you that's gonna, that's gonna tell you what due north is, something in you. And it may be that you've researched an issue and you think the direction is one way, but something inside you is telling you probably the other way, do a little more research. Uh, you know, countless times that, that, uh, that has helped me. And I've, I've, over time, you know, again, not to the exclusion of laws and precedent, uh, but over time I've come to uh, have more faith in my own gut instincts 
on issues. And, and certainly, you know, in the military context, in combat, you know, you don't have access to Westlaw and Lexus. You know, you don't have, you can't raise your hand and ask a professor. A lot of times you go on gut. Uh, but, uh, but, you know, raised in this country the way we are, you know, raised in, in, in a wash in the rule of the law that, that's envious to most countries, you know, you, you have wired into your DNA a sense for what the right answer is, a sense for what due north is, you know, ethically. Uh, and I would say, you know, I hope for you that you experience what I experienced over time, and that is a, a greater ability to rely on that trust trust that instinct so when i uh, spoke a second ago i was quickly reminded we do have uh, time for just one more question i think uh, also an important one um so as everyone on the the call can tell we had a, a lot of events leading up to our um discussion with general dyer today uh the school was put on um the, the universe Specifically, the Office of the Provost, they put on events like uh, Woman in Boots, Honoring the Hurt, uh, the LGBTQ uh, uh, event that's taking place tomorrow at, just want to make sure I get it right, at 11, from 11 to 12.30. I'm supposed to advertise there. Um, so I, I'd really like to, we'd like to hear your thoughts on uh, our school's approach to increasing veterans awareness uh, and and how uh, important this uh, uh, this mission is as a more general matter. Well, I was Stephen. I was blown away when I learned. I mean, I was I was surprised that I was invited to speak on a, a forum like this that was going to be open to law school, and then it, it expanded, uh, you know, to the entire University of Chicago. And then I started to peel the onion back. You know, I did a little research on you guys, and I saw all the programs you have. I'm not sure there's another university in the United States that has as fully developed a veterans awareness and outreach program that you guys have. I, I might be wrong on that, but to my knowledge, there's no one even in the same, uh, you know, in the same sphere. Uh, so I, I, uh, it sounds to me and it looks to me from what I saw that you've got all the bases covered. Uh, you know, and as I, as I mentioned during my comments, you know, whether you're a veteran or not, uh, you know, we live in a we live in a climate where veterans generally uh, are appreciated uh, by our fellow Americans. Um, but uh, but whether you're a veteran or not, you know, understanding and appreciating what veterans add to our communities. Uh, you know, I, I tell you, you know, in, in in my civilian practice, we for a long time have been aware of diversity issues, and a lot of times clients, you know, particularly Fortune 500 companies who want to consider hiring a firm like mine, want to know what our diversity profile looks like. Well, now an important element of that is veteran status. I mean, all of a sudden, you know, uh, this white guy is a, uh, you know, is, you know, counts for diversity purposes. And that's because companies and people who are, they're not doing that for fun. It's because companies and entities that want to be better, who want to be represented uh, by lawyers and by groups of people who more accurately represent our population are recognizing veterans. So uh, all that to say, I think you guys are doing a brilliant job. Uh, uh, Provost Lee, uh, thank you for all you're doing. Terrell, Stephen, uh, you know, two thumbs up here. I, I hope your model is one that's, uh, that's uh, observed and followed by other institutions of higher learning. Well, thank you so much, General Dyer, for uh, spending so much time with us today. You've given us a lot to think about. If I, if, if I wasn't already Army property, I, uh, I'd be running right to the recruiter uh, after this talk. So, so thank you for, for everything. And to close out the event, I'd like to introduce John Schmidt, a second year student at Harris and a child of two U.S. veterans. Uh, and, and this will be uh, uh, to close out our program today. Hey everyone, good afternoon and thank you so much for having me. Um, as Stephen mentioned, my name's John Schmidt. I'm the child of two US veterans, both retired colonels up in the Virginia area. And I'm also a liaison for the children of US veterans and graduate programs here at U Chicago, or one of the liaisons. Um, I'm also a graduate fellow at the University of Chicago's International House, who's one of our partners. 
and a first year policy student here at UChicago and also a Loyola alum, funny enough. So it's good to see so many others here. Um, so just quickly about, about OMAC, a little bit over a year ago, I reached out to uh, OMAC and Terrell specifically with a few questions and little did I know that that meeting would kind of change the course of my entire experience at the university. So long story short, when I first met with OMAC, um, I was curious if they could help me determine my eligibility for some VA entitlements from my mother, who's a permanent or 100% disabled veteran. So not only did they help me discover that I was in fact eligible for this, they made me aware of an additional benefit afforded by my father, which I'm currently using, and we're in the process of exploring another one, so I just cannot endorse them enough. Um, so for me, it's still a little bit hard to comprehend, but because of the support that I received from OMAC, I'm going to be graduating from, from the policy school, um, the Harris School here at UChicago in June, completely debt-free. This is not something that I ever really thought was, was possible, and the freedom that OMAC's help has given me means that I can shift my job search from the private sector with you know eyes on paying back that debt back to the public sector, which is the place that I always knew I wanted to be. So as the child of veterans, I know firsthand how the support from internal and external communities, like a lot of you all, um, is a key part of achieving the success uh, that, that students need and sustaining a high quality of life while you're at school. Services provided for the military affiliated communities are intended to kind of even the playing field for military families and veterans uh, as they make their transition back to civilian life. So OMAC was instrumental in helping me these goals. And I can unequivocally say that OMAC has fundamentally changed my experience here at the university. Um, and I cannot speak of, of Terrell highly enough. Uh, the University of Chicago's International House has also, you know, really shaped my time here at the university and through my membership as a, as a graduate fellow. So the, just a little brief background about iHouse. It was founded in 1932 by John Rockefeller Jr. And his vision was to, to create this place where there's a space where American and international students could live and work and study together and you know, kind of foster those, those close friendships and mutual understanding. And you know, nearly a hundred years later at this point, since its founding, Rockefeller's words definitely ring true. And as someone who served as a US Peace Corps volunteer in, in rural Senegal and West Africa, um, two years prior to coming to U Chicago, I appreciate the hard work that the International House does to carry out their mission. And I'm honored to be chosen as a recipient of their graduate fellowship this year. So as we close out our program today, I would like to thank several of our partners who've made U Chicago's veterans programming and just initiatives in general, a, a huge success this year. So. First, I'd like to thank, again, our, our partners at the International House, whose continued commitment to supporting military-affiliated students on campus goes above and beyond the call, and it's, it's really appreciated. Um, second, I'd like to thank our partners who co-hosted our increased number of Veterans Day recognition and programming events this year, the you know, Office of the Provost, uh, the School of Social Service Administration, the Law School, uh, Law School Veterans, Student Health and Counseling Services, Student Disability Services, the U Chicago Medical Center, Office of the Registrar, Booth, the Harris School of Public Policy, the Graham School, Divinity School College, Green Card Veterans, Alumni Relations and Development, and of course the Equal Opportunity Programs, the people over there like um, Bridget Collier and, and Scott Velasquez and um, Mitchell Kitlaus, Vicky Sides and, and Terrell Odom, um, of course. So third, I'd like to thank our U Chicago Office for Military Affiliated Communities, Hope for the Day, and the Chicago veterans who, through their partnership with Barbecue Productions, are going to feed 350 veterans today. So I'm sure you've you've seen the email from Terrell, but I'm he can drop in the details here as well. But the that event's going to be held at the Chicago Veterans Hub, which is at 2240 West Ogden Avenue um, here in Chicago from 445 to 645 later this afternoon. So um, we'll see if, if Terrell can put that down for you all. So thank you again to our moderator, Stephen, um, and panelists, of course, Brigadier General uh, Dyer for sharing their experiences, raising awareness for veterans and supporting our, our military affiliated students and families writ large. So thank you all to the, the brave service members and veterans for their selfless sacrifice and service for our freedoms. Thank you all.